Hey, hello everybody. I hope everybody's doing good or well or whatever you want to say it. This is Mr. V and this is for uh, Mexican American History 2328 Unit 1 Study Guide 2 of 2. Okay. Immigration 1900 to 1930. Actually, we're going to go a little further than 1930 with some of these topics. We're going to go to like World War II in 1945. Uh, a lot of these themes overlap. So Remember that some of this material, you may see this again. Um, this is your second study guide uh, <clears throat> uh, for exam one. All right. Um, now, <clears throat> I hope everybody's doing well. I'm very excited because I got my second vaccination for COVID. Uh, my arm did hurt a little bit where they did the pica somewhere in here. That used to be my dad's cattle brand. Uh, well, it, somewhere in here, they oh, right there, they got me right there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, my arm was real sore, and, and I acted like I was dying, but my wife didn't pay attention to me. And I felt tired, but not fatigued, just kind of tired and sleepy. And then when it was time to go to sleep, I couldn't go to sleep because I had insomnia, like right now. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's 1 1.14 in the morning, and I'm going to record this. Now... Remember that this is simply a study guide just to point you in the right direction when you're reading. I'm not even telling you from what reading these questions are coming from, but if you do the reading, you will connect it to the questions, okay? And you'll know what these things are, but you have to do the reading, okay? Now, we're going to start first with what is a Bracero program, and I'm going to just tell you what the Bracero program is and what it what it was intended to do it. Uh, during uh, right before World War II uh, and during World War II, the United States uh, experienced a shortage of manual stoop labor. S T O O P. When you stoop over and pick things by hand, okay. So what they decided to do is that they started. They decided that they were going to start a guest worker program where they were going to get men uh, from Mexico, and that's why you want to watch that movie that I posted there because. A harvest of loneliness, because that explains a lot of what went on in the Bracero program. I cannot tell you uh, enough of uh, what was going on uh, uh, in during the Bracero program uh, uh, and the importance of it in in uh, filling labor in the United States. Now, the deal was that they were going to get paid half in the United States, and then half was going to be held in escrow in Mexican banks. Okay? That's what we're going to leave it at right now because there's a, we're going to jump to question number four real quick. And what's going to happen here is that we're going to see the pros and cons of the Bracero program. The pros, they're making U.S. dollars. And some of these U.S. dollars are going back. Okay? Uh, that's really the pro right there. They're, and they're helping the American economy. The cons, well, there's just a lot of them, okay? But the major ones were these men came over here. They sometimes would bring their wives, and then they would have children who were U.S. citizens, okay? Now, later on, when we have Operation Wetback, question number two, okay? We went from question number one to question number four. Now we're going to question number two. Uh, don't ask me why I uh, put them this way. That's just the way I was typing when I was doing this, is that what they did is that they pretty much repatriated everybody. We're going to question number three now. We're after answering question, uh, we've already quest answered question number one. Now we're going to ask you question two, three, and four. So one, three questions, that's really one big question. What happened is that a lot of these Braceros stayed after World War II, and it was really hard to trace them. And the farm workers needed them, okay? And they felt, well, I got married here, and I already have three children here, so I'm just going to stay here. But they passed some legislation to repatriate. Repatriate means to send them back to their original country. And the way they did it was with Operation Wetback. And Operation Wetback was basically a dragnet where they would come to a farm and raid it and catch everybody that they suspected of being an illegal immigrant or a bracero and send them back. They sent a lot of legal 
Mexican Americans back, okay? Well, the con split up families, uh, hardships, humiliation. Uh, the other problem the con with the Bracero program was that Mexico wasn't very forthcoming in giving the money back to these people all in one lump sum, okay? Some of this money is still being held in Mexican banks. And, it, and if you're a descendant of a Bracero and you can find the proof that they were, they will give you this money. Now, it's going to be distributed amongst all the heirs. I had a student that did it, and it took her six years to get the money. By the time it was all said and done, she got something like, I think she told me it was like $4,300, but the amount had been... It, it had been a couple of hundred thousand dollars that had been held for such a long time, obviously 60 years in escrow, and it had it had uh, 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 a lot of interest had been accrued on it. Now, this also happened in the United States. When they deported them, they left this money in the United States. And this is the same thing that happens when me illegal Mexican workers uh, pay money into bogus social security accounts. The government keeps this money. Now, believe it or not, a Mexican, illegal Mexican-American immigrant can rightfully get that money back even if they used a bogus social security account. Okay? That, that's just the way it is. A lot of times, people will also lend their social security numbers uh, for you know, to pay child support or something else, you know, garnish wages or whatever it may be. So it's a big racket. And uh, these illegal workers are victims on a lot of fronts, okay? All right, so we tackled one, two, three, and four. Okay, let's go to number five. Give insight on a settler, sojourner, and proletariat. Be sure to expand. Well, let's, let's, let's first define what the three are. First, a settler is a settler that settles. In the case of Mexican Americans, they were first Spanish, then they were Mexican, and then they were Mexican American. Okay? How did they become sojourners? Well, they became sojourners when they traveled. Okay? They were migrate. They were migrants. Okay? And later on, after they got out of the farm, those that formed a working class, going to question number six, and created a class culture, were the ones that became a proletariat, a pro proletario. I didn't say it right, okay? I am considered proletariat, okay, because we're working class. Up, uh, you know, middle class is considered a proletariat concept, okay? Now, with all of that said, the formation of a working class will eventually raise Mexican Americans to levels where they're going to be able to fight, you know, segregation and better wages and things like that. All right. Now, it is argued that a lot of people may say that I'm actually part of the bourgeois, the upper middle class, because I'm educated. Whereas a proletariat is the working class, uh, the, I would get the not the non officially educated or, or certified. I don't, I don't, I disagree with that uh, because at the end of the day, I'm working class, just like everybody else. I have to go to work to survive, and if I miss a paycheck, I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, you know, just like you know, eighty percent of the people in the United States. All right. Now, one of the ways that individuals or Mexican Americans were able to become part of the proletariat and become part of the working class culture was through communal living and through doing things together and raising money together as in tandas or you know having a Jamaica uh, for to to send somebody to college or somebody got hurt in an accident so they were going to have a bingo to raise money for that. Or somebody died and they were going to have a cake raffle or something. Or they were going to have a, a dance, okay? And a local rancher would donate a cow and they would make barbacoa and you would get fed and come to the dance. Everything was donated and the proceeds of that would go to help whatever cause they were putting together. That actually is a form of insurance, okay? 
It is because if you, like, let's say, for example, that your daughter is going to have a quinceañera and, you know, I want to be a padrino, okay? So I tell you, I say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to give you $300 f f so you, so I want to contribute for the band. So I'm going to give you $300 or like, say, for example, I raise goats. Okay. And I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to donate, uh, I'm going to donate four goats so you can make that part of the food that you're going to, that you're going to give. So you can have cabrito asado and, you know, so-and-so is going to give you a pig and so-and-so is going to give you a rest and you're going to make, you know, different things. It's, so that in a sense, or let's say that your aunt is a seamstress and she is going to make the dress, you're, you know, and somebody else donates the material. You know, how many of you have been at a dance or have been at a quinceañera and the band says, okay, that's it. We're only, we're only paid up till midnight. And somebody gets up and says, okay, well, I'll give, I'll give $50. You know, how much will we play for that? And they'll say, well, we'll play, we'll play five more songs. And then somebody else will give more. That is compadrazgo. That is being a padrino. So when it's your turn for your daughter to have a quinceañera, then all the people that you help are going to turn around and help you because that's what they do. And it's a form of insurance, okay? You're not giving anybody any money. You're just investing money and it's going to have a return later on. And also, you extend your family kinship. You extend your family kinship. How? Because now you've made a friend a pseudo-relative. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's mi compadre. That's sometimes being a compadre is more than being a cousin with somebody. It, it's a, you know, sometimes cousins who are really close and want to be almost like, you know, brothers, they not only be, are only a part of being a cousin, but then they'll baptize a child and they'll say, pues no, pues yo y mi primo somos compadre y primo, you know, no nomás somos primo y hermano. You know, we're not just cousins because his mom is my mom's sister, but because we also participated in a, a religious and uh, social political right. Okay. And those are things are very important that I believe we still need to keep alive. Okay. I don't believe that every young lady should have a quinceañera, but if she wants to, it should not fall on the responsibility of the parent it should fall on the extended kinship because that's the way it was done. And that's the way, that's the reason Mexicans can have these huge weddings and parties because everybody chips in, you know, and it is a, it is a big fiesta, you know, so be proud of that. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you are watching and those that are, you are watching and it's said, yeah, I remember when my mom made like 25 pounds of rice for, for so-and-so, you know, and, and it was real fun because now we're closer. And those are good things, okay? Changing gears a little bit. When there's an article there about sugar beets. And I went out when I was working, when I was in graduate school, I was like, what the heck does sugar beets have to do with Mexicans? And why is it so important? Sugar beets are known as betabel, okay? And uh, sugar beets are an alternative form of sugar, beet sugar, B-E-E-T, sugar. Now, a long time ago, they used to have to pick those by hand. Se iban a pescar el betabel allá por Rosabel. That's what they used to say, right? And that was one of the first crops that they would pick because beet sugar beets or beet sugar is grown in the wintertime. In Colorado, uh, Idaho, southern Wyoming, uh, in those areas that are wide open plains, fertile fields, but it's very cold, that's when beet grows. They plant the beets in October and they harvest them right around the very, very beginning of March. You know, that's when all the migrants start moving and they start their migrant route, okay? Now, the problem is going to be that uh, it's going to create a conflict between cane sugar cane sugar growers that was dominated by Asians and then the beet sugar that is dominated by Mexican laborers. So you're going to have a conflict there. Okay. And I, I want you to read that article. I'm going to throw a couple of questions in the exam there. So I, I do want you to read this article about beet sugar 
and beet sugar is important. I would say that when you go and if it does not say on the package pure cane sugar, it's beet sugar, okay? And beet sugar is uh, less expensive, it's finer, uh, and it's not as good for you, okay? But it doesn't matter, okay? It, it satisfies the, the taste. Cane sugar is much more important, is much more uh, uh, expensive, I'm sorry, because it's harder to cultivate. You know, even today it's hard to cultivate, and the way that it's processed, it's also very. So if you get, if you go to the store and you say, I mean, uh, that, that sugar there is like the the imperial sugar is, is $6, but this one is 3 and you look at it and it doesn't say cane sugar, then you're getting beet sugar, and it's not as good. It doesn't taste as good either. But when you're poor, what else can you do, right? Now all the ricos and everything, they're what they're using, stevia and, you know, turbinado, right? Which is piloncillo, right? The brown sugar. Now all the yuppies get the brown sugar and, they, they eat that. They think it's so fancy. And we've been eating it in Mexico since what? Since that's what we grew up with, right? You have some piloncillo and you get your your grinder and you just shave a little bit off. And you taste the molasses in it because they haven't taken the molasses off. And that's the difference between beet sugar and cane sugar. That even though they take the molasses out of cane sugar, the there is still a faint taste of it. When you... When you when you consume brown sugar, real brown sugar, real brown cane sugar, then you're tasting the molasses. It tastes, I think it tastes delicious, okay? Now, give examples of how Mexicans, immigrants clung to cultural identity, food, religion, like Well, I just told you about the quinceañera, all right? We can talk about La Guadalupe. We can talk about Dia de los Muertos. We can talk about um, bautismos. We can talk about weddings. We can talk about... Um, Midnight Mass. I mean, we can talk about, you know, La Gran Plaza. We can talk about Trader's Village. We can talk about Mexican restaurants. We can talk about Fiesta. We can talk about Mexican meat markets. I mean, Tuacana, you know. That is our culture, remember? When you strip somebody of their identity, then what you do there is that you take a part of them away, okay? And you cannot do that. That's why you should never, ever turn your back on your culture. Ever. You should never do that. Number one, it's really bad. And number two, you should be ashamed of it. Okay? Pr be proud of who you are. Okay? What is nativism? Uh, is it around today? Well, I'll tell you what nativism is. And then you're going to tell me if it's still around. Right? Nativism is, let's say, for example, that I came to the United States when I was 10 in 1980. And then a cousin of mine came when he was uh, 20, my age, you know, by 1990, I was 20. And in 1990, my cousin came over. Well, by the time I was 20, I was pretty Americanized, right? And my, you know, primo would come over with his botas picudas and, and el sombrero así como taco and los pantalones bien apretados. And listening to musica de banda, and I'm like, no, primo, you can't do that anymore because you're an American. And then primo answers you in English, and he say, no, bro, you can't. You have to speak English now because you're American city, you know. And and you can't vote Democrat because you you're American. That would be a nativist, okay? And that is bad. <laughs> Nativism is bad, okay? Because what do you do when you become a nativist? Well, you shun your culture, number one. And number two, you turn your back on your identity. And number three, uh, at the end of the day, you're a Mexican, right? You know, you know, te crees ahí muy, muy, uh, muy americano, pero traes el nopal en la mera frente, right? You may think you're, you know, like me. I can talk English all I want, and I can even talk English with a British accent, but at the end of the day, this nose and the complexion of my skin and the shape of my eyes tells you that I'm Mexican and that I am of Mexican descent and there's no getting away from it. End of story, right? No ifs, ands, or buts. And I'm very proud of who I am, all right? What is a straw boss? Well, a straw boss, you know, a fancy name for a straw boss would be a subcontractor, okay? A straw boss is a guy that would say, I'm going to go to my to my rancho and I'm going to get a bunch of workers 
and I'm going to bring them to the United States to work, and I'm going to profit from them. I'm going to charge them a certain percentage of their wages. I'm not going to work uh, because I'm going to find them the jobs, and I'm going to find them where to live. Now, that arrangement is you're kind of walking a very fine line, right? Because nobody's saying that you should not be able to recruit laborers to bring to the United States legally to work, but there's nothing that says that you should take advantage of them. So if you bring them over to be part of your working crew and you pay them well and you provide them with good shelter so they can become part of the working class, then you're a good straw boss. But if you're a guy that holds their wages and has 15 of them living in a three-bedroom home and, you know, substandard conditions and you're threatening with deporting them if they don't do what you want, then you think you're not a good person, okay? So straw boss is a word given to an individual who takes advantage of Mexican laborers. A friend would be an individual who, or a kind individual would be an individual who recruits labor in Mexico and brings his crews and allows them to rise up among the ranks themselves. You know, if they decide to go work with somebody else, they're not going to say, well, I'm going to deport you or anything like that. What areas of labor did Mexican Americans fill in states like Texas, Colorado, California? And what did women in Los Angeles and San Antonio do? Well, in Texas, a lot of it was migrant working, you know, pisca, picking. Uh, Pisca is a bastardization of picking. Vamos a piscar, vamos a, a picar, vamos a, en, a juntar, vamos a las labores a cosechar. And it was too long, you know, just cosechar. Well, we just say piscar, vamos a piscar. Okay, vamos a la pisca. We're going to pick, okay? Uh, in Texas, you had that. You had ranch work. And in Texas, you also have a lot of domestic work, okay? In California, you have domestic work, you have men working in the fields, and then you have women working in the canneries, okay? In Las Embajadoras, where they would put, you know, pineapples in cans and apples and whatever it is. They would work in the canneries. Uh, now you have Mexicans working in places like Georgia and Alabama that are working in the chicken processing plants. And recently we've heard about COVID outbreaks in those chicken uh, plants. So women in Los Angeles work in the hospital, Los Angeles and in the Bay Area, in Sacramento, or in San Diego, or whatever it may be, worked in canneries. Now, a lot of these women ended up marrying sailors, and that's it. They they went with their married sailors, and they, they went ahead and they... Uh, uh, went on their way and started a new life. And this created a lot of issues because a lot of Anglo women worked in the cannery. There's a really good book called Cannery Women in Cannery Lives. Okay. And what would happen is that these Mexican American women, these Mexican women would hang around with Anglo American women that would go out and date sailors on the weekends. And what a lot of these Mexican American or Mexican girls would do is that they would send their money home and keep some and then they would go out and do the same thing. Now, eventually, this is going to lead to problems, uh, and it's going to be connected with the Zoot Suit Riots, okay? And the Zoot Suit Riots are important because, you know, that is the emergence of the Pachuco. During, during World War II, you have the emergence of the Zoot Suit, the baggy pants, the shirt, the Stacey Adams, the hat, you know, the cholo. If we actually were in class, we would watch uh, Zoot Suit. And I may still offer it if I can find the movie on, on Netflix or, or Amazon or something. Uh, but it is very important because a lot of these young men who were very proud of their clothes were beaten by uh, sailors uh, and army men. They were stripped of their clothing. They were... Uh, you know, uh, stripped till they were naked. And then they were thrown in jail for indecent exposure after they got beaten up, okay? So the Zoot Suit Riots, I'm I am going to give you some material to read on the Zoot Suit Riots later on. Uh, not, not, not very long, but you're going to have to read about the Zoot Suit Riots, okay? 
And what do they do in Colorado and in California also? In Colorado is migrant sugar beet, you know, pisca, and in California also. But in California, it was mostly agricultural work, okay? Now, what do they do in San Antonio? That's where we're going to have Emma Tenayuca. And we're going to talk about Emma Tenayuca later on, La Apasionada. Emma Tenayuca was actually before Cesar Chavez. And I believe that Emma Tenayuca deserves her own stamp and her own streets. But I guess they just don't really want to do it for her. But And she deserves her own movie, like Jovita Idar deserves her own movie and Dolores Huerta. Okay. Now, what we're talking about here is that they used to use women to pick pecans, the shell, the the fruit out of the pecans, because of their fingers. They have little fingers, and they're able to handle the pecans without breaking them. We men are not good with our hands, and they weren't being paid very much. So she's one of the ones that starts strikes, uh, labor strikes in the pecan shelling unions in San Antonio, and she's very successful. After she's successful with that. She ends up going to California and where she becomes a teacher and she teaches and eventually she comes back. And uh, she was born, uh, she was doing this in the 30s, okay? So uh, she dies young. I believe she was in her late 60s, early 70s. Uh, she only married once. I think she died of pneumonia, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe somebody can look it up and tell me about it. You know, I'll say, uh, you know, for extra credit, write something interesting about this or an individual on the exam. I don't know yet, okay? Now, uh, were women involved in strikes? Well, I just told you, Emma Tenayuca was. Uh, Dolores Huerta. Uh, do some research in the reading, okay? Uh, how did labor and mutual aid societies aid their struggle? Remember when I talked to you uh, over here? Ways that people raise money, question number seven. This is some redundancy where I do this on purpose to see if you are listening. How did labor and mutual aid societies work? Well, these the way that they collected money together is a mutual aid society. Sociedades mutualistas. Some of these were bona fide. Like, it was like a credit union. That, that's how Cesar Chavez was able to uh, help Mexican uh, Mexican American farm workers in California, where he bought some land. He started his own credit union, bought some land, and eventually... Um, started his own subdivisions, sold homes to themselves, started lending money to other people, charging them higher interest rates, and even buying power from, from Mexico, okay? Uh, so that is very important, okay? Now, um, how did Mexican-Americans fare economically during La Crisis? La Crisis is a Great Depression. Well, the same way we always do. Most of us have always been poor. So who suffers less during the during the depression? The poor, <laughs> you know, we're poor already. So we don't know what it is to 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 struggle because our jobs are always going to be there. You know, um, the jobs that a lot of this working class people were doing still had to be performed. So you'd be surprised how you know my grandmother would tell me stories about the Great Depression. Friends of mine would tell me about. You know, now people are eating, like, uh, dandelion greens. That's known as quelite, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you ate that when you were poor, you know. Now the uppies are eating it, thinking it's all fancy and stuff like that. How did women's role change during this period? Well, they became more independent because they had more money. And you ought to be able to get that from your reading, you know. Uh, and, and that, in a sense, is, is very important. Because women are going to make baby steps as they're moving up. But the base, the main empowerment of women at this time is going to be via a paycheck. Because that gives them independence to live on their own and to make their own decisions. Now, outside of that, women are not really going to be fully emancipated, you know, or, or are able to really make their own choice as long as they get married until they have an oral contraceptive, uh, until women have a reliable form of birth control, they either abstain from having sex, don't get married, uh, because if not, it's going to be one baby after another. It's not until 19, 1963, 1965 that you have an oral contraceptive that women can take 
and not say anything about it. And by doing so, by taking an oral contraceptive, they're able to dictate when they want to have a child, how long they want to work, uh, and all of that. Okay, so uh, com complete complete uh, uh, independence of women is still to be seen. Okay, as I said before, we still don't pay women what we're supposed to pay them. All right. Now, lastly, how are Mexican Americans criminalized by the criminalized by the government? Well, we go all the way back to uh, the impact of you know, Operation Wetback and repatriation and legislation. First, you ask them to come over here. And now you deport them by force because they stayed here too long. How else do you criminalize Mexicans? Well, you criminalize them because of what they wear in the zoot suit riots. You criminalize them because of how they behave or that you stereotype them or even in nativism. Even a Mexican can criminalize another Mexican by adding to the stereotype um, in a xenophobic and nativist way, okay? So, you know, we still see the, the criminalization of Mexicans by the government. You know, President Trump, former, yay, former President Trump said, you know, Mexicans is, Mexico's sending over rapists. You know, no, you know? Uh, it is. It, there are studies that show that that Mexican immigrants c commit a lot less rapes than 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 most people than other ethnicities. Let me and let me just leave it at that. Okay. So it's real easy to to criminalize. You know. You know. And and, and we and and not just the government, but individuals. That you know, you'll see a, a Mexican an Asian and an African-American standing in a corner and somebody will say, oh my God, I wonder what they're doing. They're not doing anything. Why do you have to criminalize them? You know, uh, I think that we've all fallen into that trap at least once in our life. You know, we, we, we cannot perpetuate those stereotypes. But Mexican immigrants were criminalized by the government, primarily by the passing of laws that would re forcefully repatriate them without due process okay i can't tell you enough that you must watch the videos and you must do your reading and i'll be checking on you okay i want all of you to be kind to each other uh i want you to wear your mask and if you have an opportunity to take the uh vaccine take it mine was the pfizer like i said my side effects were very minimal you all take care uh, I hope you watch the video and thank you for your time. And if you like it, put a like. Let me know what you think. Thank you. Bye-bye.